welcome to the Dynamics 365 show. This episode is for Microsoft partners and anyone invested in the Microsoft Partner Network. I want to tell you about a new company I've been working with called MapTasker. They're a Dynamics 365 ISV, and I like the way they combine location intelligence as well as geospatial data and AI with data overlays including satellite and drone imagery. I tell you what, I wish I had MapTasker when I was running a Dynamics practice across Australia. I used to travel interstate several times a week, so frequent in fact that at one point, the person reviewing my expense reports questioned whether I was taking taxis to the office each morning rather than flying to the airport I was going so often. MapTasker allows you to visualize your Dynamics 365 customer and lead data on a map and helps you plan your day. It takes into account things like travel times and existing appointments in your Outlook calendar. Imagine planning a trip to see a customer and knowing which prospects you could fit in to visit before getting home to pick up your kids for the rugby practice. To download their free app, go to maptasker.com. Today's guest is a Microsoft veteran with 22 years at the company. We dive deep into the partner ecosystem, we discuss readiness and what the future holds for Microsoft partners. We also explore women in tech and how to tune into hearing all the voices based on the premise of inclusiveness in the workplace. I welcome Carissa Allen to the show who currently oversees the Microsoft Business Application Partner Ecosystem for customer engagement worldwide. Check out the full show notes for this episode at nz365guy.com forward slash 77. Welcome to the Dynamics 365 show. Carissa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure. It's good to have you on. So before we get started, can you tell us a bit about your origin story? Okay. How did you come to be in IT? How did you come to work for Microsoft? And a bit about perhaps your family Okay. and uh, kind of what you do in your spare time. Sure, absolutely. So, well, I'm what we would call a Pacific Northwest native. So in the States, that would be, I grew up in a combination of Washington, Alaska, and Oregon. And I, I now live in Redmond, Washington, which is probably not much of a surprise. I have three daughters. So my life is very busy. I have a husband who works at Microsoft. So that, that's a little bit of us on the personal wow. side. Wow, all in the house. All in the house, yes. Mm, mm. And then... You know, how I came to how I came to Microsoft is one of the stories that I actually use quite often when I'm in any kind of a coaching situation or mentoring situation. I refer to coming to Microsoft as a violent shove in the right direction because, OK, so I've been in high tech for 25 years and I normally don't tell people that because they start doing math. right? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny, but I actually had been involved in high tech for a little bit before Microsoft came knocking and I turned them down the first time. And I thought I was on a different path with my life. I thought I was moving overseas. There may or may not have been a man involved, whatever. And then everything changed. And the, the week that everything changed in my current job and my relationship status, et cetera, Microsoft called me and they said, we don't normally do this, but we would really like you to reconsider. And I was like, okay, this, this is a sign from the universe. And the rest has kind of been history. So that's how I joined Microsoft. I think you had a question about what do I do in my spare time? Yeah. So, well, okay. So I have three daughters. So we have a pretty scheduled life. It's pretty busy. I do love to travel. So the job I'm currently in has worked out just wonderfully for me because I get to pair two of my passions, right? Microsoft and working with people and travel. I'm very much into fitness and yoga. I do a lot of hot yoga. It's funny because I typically don't sit still well, but if you get yoga class, 90 minutes is like my time, right? Nobody can so really that, bother me. Is that Bikram Root Yoga? Is that yeah, it is. Okay. It is. Wow. Yeah. So, and I love to read. I like devour books. And then I write. And I've been working on finding my voice and getting brave. I've been publishing a little bit on LinkedIn. Historically, in my past, I've written like closeted fan fiction, right? Or something like that. But yeah, so that, that's that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Wow. What a journey. So first of all, something that popped out to me, Alaska. Tell me about yeah. your time in Alaska. So people assume that I'm an army brat because I moved up to Alaska and I moved my whole life. I'm not. So again, this is another little point in time that people can do math. We moved up to Alaska when the pipeline was going in. So there was an oil pipeline that was being created, built 
from basically Nome all the way down through to, to move the oil. And my father is actually a banker. There was so much money <laughs> up there that people were just starting banks. And so we went up with the pipeline boom. I spent three years in Fairbanks, which as a very young child was fascinating because it is the land of the, you know, all night sun. I remember arguing with my mom about, I, it's not time to go to bed. I can still hear them playing baseball in the park across the street, but it was like 11 o'clock at night. I remember walking home at dusk from school. I remember a moose eating my mom's garden. I mean, it is just an amazing place. And I will never forget the Northern Lights. That I, I was, gonna, I, I was yeah. going to, the minute you said the long nights, mm -hmm. like I've been to Iceland and I've Ooh. experienced the Northern yes. Lights and it's been incredible. And yeah. so, so like you would experience them pretty mm -hmm. regularly, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes. And there's some that I remember. I remember my parents were out one night and they actually came back from their like date night early to wake us up and take us out on the back porch because it was literally, as they say in the legends, I mean, the sky was on fire. It was the most beautiful thing. Alaska taught me a real appreciation for, for nature, I would definitely say. And people in Alaska are really interesting. So it's a really interesting place. So just on the Northern Lights, do you find uh -huh. it's hard to explain to people what you're experiencing when you you look at them? Yes, it, it totally, really right? is. It is because it's like it's like art, yeah. but it's moving, and yeah. you expect it also to have some kind of not heat, but you you just expect there's a there's some kind of a feeling. I'm like right now I'm like sitting here and my hands are like moving back and forth trying to describe it. It any words we give it makes it flat. Mm -hmm. It just, I agree. It, totally you just agree. have to see it for yourself. And if you were in Iceland, you saw a version of it. I, I also have had that experience. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it was just like everything was alive around me type yep. thing. And, you know, uh, I traveled out to, is it to a total dark area, you know, so to get the full effect without mm -hmm. any city lights and it was just, yeah, indescribable. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you also talk about travel. Where's mm -hmm. been the favorite, your most favorite place that you've traveled overseas? Oh, you're going to get me in trouble with all of my friends. I know. I know. I, <laughs> I ask a lot of people this, but that's, that's, that's all cool. And, and don't butter me up with New Zealand because I come from there, but tell, tell, tell me somewhere else. Well, that's on my list because I haven't made it there yet. So oh, okay. there are so many places that I've enjoyed. I have to tell you, I have a place in my heart for Amsterdam. Not mm -hmm. quite sure why, except for very welcoming. I felt very safe. I heard that laugh. That's not why. And <laughs> but good food, everything. Yeah. It Again, is a... go ahead. Yeah, I know. I agree. I love the city. <laughs> mm. And Paris will always have a place for me. That was my first international destination when I was in high school. One of my first international business trips for Microsoft was Dubai, which was just a trip. And I met amazing people there. I met amazing people everywhere. So, I mean, long list. I was in Madrid a while back. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. So already there's like 10 places I haven't named. I'm going to get emails about. Yeah. 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 No. Awesome. Awesome. So you've worked at Microsoft for 22 odd years. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about your career journey then within the company? How yeah. did you get in first of all? Cause you mentioned they, they had hunted you. Yes. So then how did, how's your journey gone? So I started with a company, how many people I think start with their company, which was in a version of inside sales. So I joined in inside sales. I actually managed our top partners, right? I was the inside sales rep for our top partners and then moved that, parlayed that into um, field roles where it was either first it was partner account manager, which was very similar to the role today, but bigger budgets. Let's be fair. Let's be honest. And then moved into enterprise account sales. So I was an enterprise account manager for nearly seven years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely loved it. So when I talk about my career at Microsoft, I pivot highly towards field. Okay. So my first 19 years were in the field. Now, when I was an enterprise account manager, I had great relationships with, with most of my accounts. And I will never forget the day that a CIO called me up and he's like, Carissa, I need a CRM system. I was just reading that you guys released one and I need you to get over here and show it to me. And I'm like, look, CRM, what? Okay. You know, and we went over and that was CRM 1.0. And it was the first customer on the West Coast of the United States to buy it. And here's what I thought as an, as an account manager. I'm sitting in the room and there's a bunch of new people in the room. I'm like, okay, I'm meeting new people in my account. And then the conversations were totally different. And then they took me into their customer support center, right? And showing me the 15 screens that people had to go through and all the training they had to do. And it became so tangible. I just, I fell in love 
with business conversations and business applications right there, right? Even though I was a user of them as a seller, right? What it did for me as an account manager, the conversations and the relationships, it just, I, it just blew my mind. And so that started my relationship with what is now called Dynamics 365. And I parlayed that enterprise account manager role into, and coincidentally, I had my first baby, didn't want to be on a plane every week. So they tapped me on the shoulder again and said, listen, why don't you move over to this new marketing role we have, which is industry and business applications. It's a new thing. They weren't sure about it. So I started doing that again, love the conversations that changed into a regional role. Then it became a U.S. wide role to look after our enterprise accounts, basically CRM, what we called it at the time, dynamic CRM. And then Once the girls got older, I mean, I have to be completely upfront. That's a big thing to make our decisions for us, right? Once the girls got older, I wanted to have an international job. And for the first time, Microsoft was going to invest a full headcount for a worldwide lead for our corporate accounts, the mid-market space for business applications. And that was my entry into worldwide. And then I moved over to one commercial partner looking after these four workloads. Wow. Wow. So just out of a selfish question here, just yeah. so I can understand understand a few things. So you actually started working in the US subsidiary Correct. rather than corp, right? Correct. And so so at how many years in before you transferred to corp um, out of the US sub? 19. Okay. So you okay, so you got a very yeah. thorough field-based experience before you went into corp and, and I assume took a, a massive amount of knowledge uh, with you and, and doing that. That's fantastic. It's a, that's fantastic. As in, I just find so many people around the world that I've talked with, they don't understand the subsidiary nature of Microsoft, if you like, within country and the difference of how that separates from corp. And, uh, you know, if you like where, where the software engineering's teams type sit as opposed to being, you know, in, in the field. So, okay. So that, that, that makes sense to me. You are so, correct. I, I'm going to interrupt you because you are yeah. absolutely correct as far as that goes. And if I don't get into the field every six to eight weeks, I go crazy. It's, that's my base. And you're right that there is a fundamental, there can be at times an opportunity to bridge that that difference. And that is one of the benefits I feel that I've brought to corp. I occasionally get at odds sometimes with people because I consider corp servant to the field. I really do. I think everything corporate does should be to make the field more efficient or whatever. And, you know, it's interesting to have the different conversations about who leads on some things, but all in all, everyone's doing their best with the best of intentions. Yeah, I reckon in the last couple of years that I've seen that happening more and more that that I really feel like, you know, my engagement is mainly with the product team at Corp. And there definitely seems to be a pivot in the last couple of years where the product team is much more, how would you say, they're open, they're listening to to the field a lot more. We used to see a lot more, should we say, I think dictator is too much of a strong term, but like sure. w- w- all all the knowledge sits up there and we're going to uh-huh. pass it out to you. Yes. And definitely there's been, a, and it's been a great move. And it's, you know, a lot I've seen since James Phillips particularly came into role, we've seen this massive transformation happening, which is, which is exciting. Absolutely. I'm glad you feel that. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely and I mean, it. I, I just feel that partners feel more heard uh, as, as, you know, in, in what I've seen. Good. So you're now, you oversee business application partner ecosystem and focusing around customer engagement. Correct. So what, what does that include? So what's your day-to-day in, in that role? So the day-to-day is interesting. Let's talk about what the role all up is. So the four customer engagement workloads, so sales, field service, customer service, and marketing. And you could technically take marketing and split it into Adobe and then Dynamics 365 for marketing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if you'll humor me for a second, it's really interesting to look across those four workloads because they are at such different stages of evolution. You know, you've got sales, you've got the partners who have been with us in some cases since CRM 1.0, you know, or whatever. Some who joined us for CRM online and then others who joined us for Dynamics 365. It's a really healthy ecosystem. The goal there is just to keep everybody energized and selling together and learning about AI and just keep the momentum. Don't get me wrong. The water is fine. Come on in. We could always use more partners. That one, though, pretty solid. Field service. Field service is so much fun because it's so tangible. 
you know, if you listen to Ben Ballmer talk, right, it's so tangible about you can look at a business process and go, if I rolled that truck better, more efficiently, I'd increase my profits by X. Field service has a need for domain expertise in addition to having really good functional consultants. And that's the challenge with field service. I feel we have a lot of capacity with field service. We need to get better about activating it. And we, I, it would be great to have some more domain expertise, but we can't exactly clone those people. Customer service right now is just humming along. I mean, there are so many partners transacting customer service. The thing with customer service, as you know, is that that solution is evolving so fast into omni-channel and it's changing what a partnership looks like. So in a position right now, working with Tom Yang and others on customer service to how do we evolve, how we engage and make sure we're prepared for the changes so we don't end up in a situation where we feel a little bit like we feel with field service, which is like, oh, we need more people, right? Which may or may not be the case. And then marketing, psh, marketing, little engine that could. Marketing has not been available for more than a year. Marketing did an initial release in like April in a few countries and then went worldwide in October. When I was at Inspire last year presenting, we thought we were launching marketing and getting people excited. I had so many partners walk up and say, I'm already transacting it. It's pretty good. By the way, you need to improve X, Y, and Z. So it's there's so much energy. I love it. I absolutely love it. So those are the four workloads and kind of you see how I some days I'm schizophrenic depending on which conversation I'm having. So you, you said there about customer service doing extremely well, but we didn't really touch too much on sales. And mm -hmm. I do, I've, I've noticed in recent times, as in coming out of the product team, is a real investment in sales. And mm -hmm. I just, it's kind of like sales is, you know, as you say, it's, it was around from 1.0. Yeah. And I just see that, you know, the effect that AI is going to have oh, yeah. on on sales is is really it'll be a massive shift, I think, in business and that, that salespeople can, I, I think, you know, for years, salespeople felt that management puts, you know, CRM in to kind of see or track what was going on. But they, a lot of salespeople, uh, you know, if they didn't understand the value of it, didn't see that it was providing much benefit back for all the data they're entering. But I just uh -huh. see in, in the new world we're going into this massive ability with an AI overlay to get tangible, you know, insights like and i know that word's bandied around a lot but really practical application of how to engage their customers better because of the the you know whether it's the 0365 data being mm -hmm. pulled in through through outlook or exchange whether it's the you know the frequency of engagement the you know the contact frequency via any of those omni channels as you referred to over in customer service are you seeing that pick up as well inside microsoft that 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 there's that whole new fresh look at how sales is going yeah i really do there's a lot of excitement there's it's no longer hasn't been for years now but it's no longer the go in and do an sfa head to head competition right it's it's not about that it's it's literally about the efficacies it's literally about how do you help companies leverage all this data that they know is there this is james phillips favorite thing i love how he talks about it everything's spewing data well even sales and then how do you use that to help guide your teams to help them be more efficient in the right ways and you know even internally so we're using AI to do a lot of our forecasting now in certain segments that AI does it better than people in some cases. And it's not the thing isn't it's going to replace people's jobs. No, it's going to help them focus in other areas, right? What seller doesn't want to focus more time on actually closing the deals and working with customers as opposed to forecasting. Exactly. Exactly. So. I mean, that's a whole interesting debate on the side about the future of AI and its effect. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it's one of my passion areas, but I just think, you know, cause I've come from a very strong a sales background myself. And I just think that the tools that are out there now and that are, you know, we're seeing more and more. It's just, uh, man, I would lo love them 10, 15 years ago. I think I could have done exactly. so much more, right? No, that's how I feel. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, put me in coach. You know, I'm ready to go back because these tools now, you know what I could do? It's super exciting. It's super fun. And I think people are starting to get comfortable. And Microsoft is doing, I feel, really good job of explaining what AI for sales is, AI for customer insight. You know, it's, we really have to not just, have AI become like a blanket term, like portal was or whatever. You have to be really specific with your, your uses for it. Yeah. So true. So true. So how do you see partners or if you like practices mm -hmm. that have traditionally done dynamics based implementations in the past, how do you see them evolving moving forward? 
So there's a couple interesting things. And, and one of the topics I tend to have of conversation I have with partners is around in the past, you we went in and we either talked to ERP or we talked to CRM, right? There was kind of this wall in between and never the two shall meet. And I, I see our ecosystem really changing and Dynamics 365 on this, this app-based approach that map to business processes really is helping change that conversation. And so the partner of the future, you have to completely respect where people have come from and where their skill sets are. But the partner of the future is kind of putting aside I'm ERP or I'm CRM and really thinking more along the lines of business processes and looking at the next workload to add, right? So a, a typical ERP partner might be adding field service. Those are so similar. And frankly, if you've got a field service opportunity, it's probably got an ERP component. And if you have an ERP opportunity, it could very well be driven by a need to improve field service, right? So there's that I see this happening. I see sales partners uh, starting to get more into marketing. Same thing with customer service. And and I also find this, you have to bear with me on this one, but I find that partners who get more specific and get more focused actually broaden the conversation. So that sounds like slow down to speed up, but it and it almost kind of is. But if you get really clear on what you do well and what the tools are, so don't lead with the tool, don't lead with Dynamics 365 for blah, lead with what you do well and then bring the tools in as needed, your conversations are just going to blow wide open. And the partners who get that, and there are many, are going to do incredibly well. One other area I would just add is change management. That is becoming more and more important for partners to have a practice around that and be incorporating that into their overall offering. Yeah. A hundred percent agree. So yeah. like you're talking about ProSci as an example. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. To totally agree as in being on many projects with and without ProSci being involved and I'd take the ProSci based projects yes. for, for, for the successes I've had when implementing that from, from the get go is always part of the very initial discussions. And I tell you, it proved itself time and time again over those that didn't have change management. Great. Yeah. So, okay. So tell me now a couple of things that you raised there, which I find, you know, if I put my partner hat back on and I was 20 years partner mm -hmm. side and my experience was that the traditional partner found it very difficult to, and still do to, to some degree, depending on the size of the partner to pivot yeah. and be able to, for example, you know, ERP and, and CRM or AX and or yeah. Navision, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and CRM were, were always two totally separate things. And one of the things I struggled with the concept of having a, a practice that had both was that if I went in and pitched Dynamics and I was, let's say I would take another partner, I'm, I'm thinking of one scenario, which we had they were actually pitching NAV and as the ERP solution for this particular company. And what would happen is that I could present myself, do all the pre-sales, and even the sales in that motion, single-handedly myself. But when the ERP side come in, for just, let's say, a demo, there would be four different demo people involved because there'd be yeah. the GL side of it, there'd be warehousing, there would be, you know, uh, if they were dealing with foreign accounts, there'd be a specialist in that area, you know, currency exchange, that type of thing. And so what I've seen is that a lot of partners said, you know, if they didn't if you like start with a, you know, the traditional financial kind of experience, it was very hard for a CRM partner to jump into the financial space without either going out investing in headcount, yeah. you know, of, of, you know, which often was ra involved raiding another partner, mm -hmm. um, yes. you know, to do that. And so are you seeing though now, cause like I've been 18 months since, you know, um, running a practice are you seeing a change starting to happen where like the bigger companies, uh, and I talk about the, you know, the big four accounting firms or consulting companies that are now all spun up in the last three to four years, you know, dynamic space businesses. Are you seeing much more of the whole finance and CRM type story coming through from the field? I know it's been something that Microsoft have pushed for and, you know, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years, but you're seeing, you know, practices becoming more broader now. You know, I am seeing some. I agree with you that those might not be the two that happen first, right? It might be a sales might broaden out to marketing or to customer service. I definitely think, like I said earlier, that ERP and field service kind of go together. I, I do think 
you run the risk, right? I do think as companies are doing digital transformation, they everything comes on the table. And then it's a question of how the, how the partner can help them prioritize what to address first, because things are related. Things do, one does impact the other. If you boil the ocean though, that could really increase your sales cycle. That brings more decision makers in. So it, there's a challenge there. I do think the transfer to, transformative, if I can say the word, wins that we're seeing in some of the big companies are around business processes, potentially all up, or we're doing this first and they also announce the intention to do the next. I agree with you completely that it's very hard to do that. It's not really cross training, but I mean, it's, it's those two conversations can get intermixed a little too much. So it will come. Mm, I don't think it personally, it's, it is cross training. It's like, you know, I've always likened it to if I've, if I've got a brain tumor, I want a brain surgeon operating yes. on me. I don't want an orthopedic surgeon. Right. And I just feel that our areas have become so broad. Like, you know, when I chose 16 years ago, just to specialize in dynamics, people call me crazy. Like yeah. why just one product? Now it's not a case of specializing in dynamics or the power platform. It's now going actually which workload within that are you going to yes. specialize because it's so broad in its own right. And so that's why I think it's, it's, it's additional headcount. You can have generalists kind of, but I think you need to have real deep depth of mastery to, to own those, you know, all, all the parts of the equation. I agree. We do run the risk especially, mm. and there's more apps coming, right? I'm not like, yeah, letting absolutely. a cat out of the bag here. We run the risk of being a mile wide and an inch deep. And so it does then add a little bit of burden on the partners to know when to bring in what, right? You want to start the conversation broad because again, if you go in and you know this, I mean, you go into an ERP, you go, okay, we're here to talk about upgrading your ERP system because it's been 14.2 years and it's time. You're missing the point possibly that what's driving that new, that RFP or whatever for ERP is actually the field service team. So you have to have the conversation spot, but then yes, again, kind of like what I was saying earlier, you need to get specific then quickly what we can do and what your special sauce is as a partner, maybe for that one app and then lead to the next and then lead to the next. Yeah. So true. So true. So like you're involved in readiness. How mm -hmm. is that? What is readiness looking yeah. like, you know, going forward and how, how do partners need to really create a system of drinking from the fire hose? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so we have not made this, this easy and this is all change management for ourselves and we being just the community in general i'm not like you know picking on any particular person so back in the day the story i like to tell is back in the day it was not that long ago we would do airlifts everyone would get on a plane come to redmond or go to whatever location was chosen two weeks all together lots of red bull and just learn and you'd learn and then you go out and you would sell and market and support and deploy all that stuff the same way for two and a half years. For two and a half years, no one changed, right? That's back when things were on-prem. And even for online, when we first started, we didn't do releases that often. Now with Dynamics 365 and every six months, oh my goodness, that's not gonna work, right? And so what we're asking the community to do, a community that's already seen so much demand, is we're asking the community to start thinking about readiness, more like going to the gym or something along those lines, where it needs to be a steady trickle, a steady, it needs to be a practice. So 30 minutes a day, two hours a week, whatever, you need to be scheduling your readiness and doing it, or you're going to quickly get behind. That is very difficult for an organization that's based on billable consultants, right? And what we're just asking people to do is instead of setting aside two weeks, every two years, you're going to set aside time every week. Now, there are things we can do to help, and I'm seeing some really interesting things coming out of Microsoft, and true to form, we need to get the word out better, and we need to be a little bit more prescriptive. You know, we have on-demand trainings now. We have virtual instructor-led training now. We have boot camps. I still think those are so important, especially for new workloads and three to 400 level. And then there's also, like, there's consultant help, and there's, there's different things that are available now to meet the needs the other thing too, and this is going to go into a topic we'll talk about maybe later, is people learn differently. And so I'm really happy with some of the things I'm seeing with readiness where they're realizing that people learn differently. So we need to provide things in different formats to help empower that. That's pretty cool. So are there also changes then coming to the way the Microsoft Partner Network, MPN type function? And, and what are those changes for the rest of this calendar year at least? 
So yes, to answer the short answer is yes. And what was interesting is when I first stepped into this role, I got I was pulled into quite a few meetings about the new NPN and this idea of guided experience. And at first I was like, what is this craziness? What are you trying to do? Now that I've seen it, it's brilliant. And the the analogy I have, and it's silly, but when those kiosks first went into grocery stores where you check yourself out, I was like, why would I do that? Why are you putting your labor on me? And now I'm like, especially if I'm busy, especially when the kids were young, it's like, just get me out of here. You go up and you do it yourself and you walk out. It's on my time. It's based on what I need at that moment. And so guided experience is becoming much more about that for partners. Partners can go out to guided experience, business applications guided experience, and by workload, they can see what the market potential is. They can see readiness plans. They can get, you know, customer ready presentations. They can get, like I said, technical help. It's becoming much more about partners grabbing what they need when they need it, as opposed to when Microsoft deems, we're going to give this to you now, or we're going to have this event now, or you're going to need to call your person to get this. It's much more accessible. And keep in mind, guided experience right now is a 1.0, right? And we all know Microsoft in 1.0, V1.0. But if the vision for it and some of the announcements that I'm sure are going to come out at Inspire and how partners are going to get better insight into their overall contribution, their overall you know, effectiveness when deploying and their engagements with R&D even. I, there's some cool stuff coming and it's all in the name of visibility and predictability. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, so awesome. Listen, this, this question is a bit of a curveball, but okay. you know, about, about two years ago, the Dynamics uh, group, if you like, worldwide were moved into enterprise from memory. It was enterprise, I think it was. And and therefore, at a subsidiary level, headcounts yeah. changed. And there was a bit of feedback from some partners about a feeling of abandonment, if you like, um, through that process. How, you know, you're two years on now. What Where, where are things at? So there, there was two things that, that happened. So one, and I can speak from my U.S. experience. So as a general rule, business applications, dynamics, uh, I use the two interchangeably, used to be its own pretty much separate org. We spoke our own language. You know, our sellers did zero to 100 percent, which is not a traditional, by the way, solution sales professional. If you think about what we call our sellers, they were acting like account managers, OK, which is a different role, frankly. Solution specialists are supposed to be specialists. We were kind of running our own thing. And so when this was this was one of my main jobs when I was in the U.S., is, you would have an enterprise account executive, if they saw something that even looked like CRM or heaven forbid, looked like ERP, immediately just throw it over the wall and let the Dynamics team handle it. It's too complicated. It's a potentially scary conversation with a three letter acronym that I don't know, you know, CSO, CMO, whatever. And the whole point uh, from account based, from, the, uh, from managing accounts, the point was this, we have so many people at Microsoft selling and there was one group that was doing so much of the heavy lifting with business applications and we needed to secure better conversations for those other sellers. Why not leverage them? And so we, we did what you said, right? It was like we put dynamics into what we call our, our specialist organization as opposed to having a separate sales org. And the whole goal is get everyone comfortable with these conversations. That takes time. You know, there's a lot of change management in there. I always felt when I was working with sellers, I was surprised they weren't more comfortable with it. Because if you think about an account manager, they're managing a territory. They have to manage a pipeline. That's the same thing a VP of sales is doing. Go talk shop. Don't be scared because they're in a carpeted hallway. They're not in the IT section. Same thing for my marketers that I used to, you know, coach, mentor, whatever. It's like, hey, you're your own CMO. Go talk to the CMO, right? Have a business conversation. That was on the account side. We're still working through that. I think Hayden Stafford and his team do amazing, amazing work. On the partner side, it's been about 18 months, maybe a little bit more, since one commercial partner was, was created. And it's getting its legs underneath it now. So the goal of one commercial partner was there was like, I forget how many partner works at Microsoft. I always feel empathy for the partners. It's like, okay, who's calling me now? Who do I have to talk to? What, what form do I have to fill out for who? And the goal was one interface, one consistent interface. Well, what happens with that when you have a very developed business applications partner ecosystem, 
20, 30 years sometimes, right, in the business, and you bring them in to a bigger org with people who don't know business apps as much, there was absolutely this sense of, why am I educating you about my business? The person before you I'd worked with for eight years, and they basically helped manage my pipeline, which, by the way, that that PSE role, that, you know, that partner sales, hardest role in the company. I've been here a long time. I've worked with a lot of roles. I think that role was incredibly hard. And we had amazing people doing it. So what we're seeing now is, you know, as we work through OCP, you're seeing more investment on business applications. You're seeing more understanding, especially as we we talk about how we impact Azure. My message is in this very long answer to your question is it is getting better. It's taken a while. I do have faith in OCP that things are going to start firing better on all cylinders. And I know Hayden's very committed to that. I know Cecilia Flambaum, who I work with, is committed to that. It's all good. I can completely understand and have empathy for the feeling in the field. No, it's good. It's good. It's definitely all progressing in the right direction, which is great. The intent is right. The intent, which is that we all bigger reach for everybody, right? Yeah. More resources. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So I want to switch subjects now. You know, I met you at Dynamics 365 Saturday in Scotland. Right. And I saw that you were running some roundtable sessions with women. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So I, it's interesting. So I have a passion around women in technology. And Mm -hmm. so my, my nature is I like to connect with people. I will tell you that, you know, this format right now with you asking me questions and me answering, Mm -hmm. that's so out of my nature. I want to ask you questions. (laughs) I still want to ask you questions and talk with you more. And, um, but this is great. So I naturally lean towards connecting with people and mentoring and how I came into it. There was a couple things that happened at the same time, which was one, when I, about eight to 10 years ago, a lot of the mentors I had in the company started leaving. And they were basically women who were at the position I am at now. They were a similar age. Their children were the similar a- were at similar ages. They were at the same level of influence and impact in the company. And they were leaving. And so that was interesting. And I also, at that time, started to be exposed more to groups with, how do I say it, who were kind of early in career right? Or new enroll. And so I go and I would talk with them about biz apps and get everybody excited. And they started reaching out to me for mentoring. And, and so I kind of have this situation where I'm like, okay, I've lost my mentors and people are asking me to mentor. This is fascinating. And so I just kind of fed this, right? It feeds me. And so I just kept going with it. When I started to get involved with Dynamics 365 Saturdays, Janet Robb was, uh, is an amazing person. She's like, you know, she something? Is indeed. <laughs> oh, and she's a force. And she was like, you're going to be here. Let's just, let's just do a women in technology lunch. This was in Dublin a while back. And I'm like, sure, I'd love to. And we just pulled people together. We literally, literally, we found this like hallway corner. We just like pulled everybody over there. And that was the start of it. And it was, I was always like, I'm not saying anything profound. And it's just like to facilitate conversations. My, my goal in life is to make connections for people, right? If I can connect two people and they, they hit it off. Awesome. And then we started to work on it more and more. And then in Scotland, we did, you know, official sessions. We did an official session in London. Each one is different. And I, don't, I could talk about this forever. I'm sorry, Mark. It's just like, no, it's good. It's the energy in the room is pretty cool. And it's, it's just about connecting people and just having a conversation about, hey, anything, you know, what challenges are you facing? Anything we could help you with? This is a group of people at different points in their career. Let's just, let's just talk. Mm, mm, mm. And it's turned into a lot more now, actually. Okay. Right? So tell us about, you You wrote an article which you published on LinkedIn um, mm-hmm. called All the Voices. What's yeah. inspired that piece? And can you tell me a bit about your thinking around it? Yeah. And that was really interesting to write. So my friends at TDG, and it's that Dynamics gang, they're changing their name now to be a little That's bit more right. inclusive. Correct. They so. Are. They, you know, we had run into each other at London, spent a lot of time together in Scotland. And Will came up to me and he's like, would you consider writing a blog post about these roundtables you've been doing? Because people are really, the word's getting out. People are saying that, you know, they had some impact. We want to learn more. And so I said, sure. And so we co, I co cross published it, whatever you want to call it with them. And I basically just kind of sat down and said, you know, what, what have I gotten out of this? And why are we doing this? Because I got a lot of questions from people at the event 
about well, why why do this? I mean, we treat everybody the same, right? I mean, we're all we're all nice people. I don't understand why why do you have to have this super secret lunch? And and I just wanted to articulate what what the goodness that comes out of it, right? And how it goes out and it multiplies. And so that's how the the post came about. And I I spent time on it. I didn't want to come across as preachy, but I did want to articulate that it's just about all the voices. It's not necessarily about the women, right? And if you empower women, they can go and help empower others. Yeah. So, yeah. So good. So good. So today I sat down with uh, uh, a lady called uh, Sarah Critchley and she's a, an MVP uh, based in the UK. And she was actually delivering a session most recently at one of the Ignite events called Diversity at Events. Yes. And she she's carried out some surveys, et cetera. And one of the things that of surveying different females, you know, in the IT space that we're working in, et cetera, came out a thing around positive discrimination. And I thought, well, that's an interesting concept, which is dangerous. The co- yeah. So, so when uh, so she explained it to me today over lunch and that it is there's a feeling that when when events are trying to balance, if you like, their gender or their inclusion mix, they are feeling that they are being asked, as in some women have been asked to present at these events purely because they were born um, a certain way. In other words, they and, you know, some of the, the, the things that came out from this is, you know, in the surveys that she ran that they feel hurt, they feel like, that that they're not necessarily the best person for the job, but because they're a female, therefore they're being put up. And so, you know, and it's an interesting thing because, you know, I have been, you know, involved in events recently where, you know, the gender, the idea was to get at least parity in the gender mixes. And I know we're only talking about gender here, but inclusion goes a lot wider than that. Yeah. So I, I think that, it's a much broader and more complex topic than just going, yes. hey, we need to balance the numbers type thing. So it is interesting because one of the things I did talk about is we apply dashboards to things, right? And that was what all the voices was talking about. It's like, okay, we have our 4.2 purple people and we have our 5.8, whatever. And people think that, okay, we've checked those boxes. We're done. And what all the voices was about is about inclusion. The fact that you have to make an effort and slow down and listen to the different voices that you spent so much time bringing in. What you were just talking about is something I'm also very sensitive about, which is, and I've seen it. I have seen it a lot of times where it's like you go from seeing an event with all male presenters to the feedback comes, hey, you need a more diverse team up there to skewed really quickly towards a group with diversity, which is great, but are they really the right people to be up there? It is such a dangerous dance. And the reason why dashboards help is it helps people get the opportunity, right? And we need then to help the community support them so that they then build the expertise. And I do feel, this is going to be a little bit controversial, but I do feel that in the name of dashboards, we sometimes pivot way too fast. And you're right. And you will actually put somebody in a situation where they're not going to feel successful or worse yet, they're not going to feel appreciated. And so we really need to focus more on the inclusion, right? Giving the people the opportunities to shine and listening to them and, and just, and then promoting them as appropriate. So it does not surprise me that that topic came up, and I think it is a valid topic for everyone to keep in mind. Yeah. So so what I've observed from the events I've been to recently that I am seeing an increasing number of uh, female participants yes. is that this is, this is what I, if you like, let's say the execution hasn't necessarily been perfect, but what I have noticed is that it seems to be attracting more women mm-hmm. attendees, which is fantastic. And there's something about when I observe the way, if you like, women bond and communicate, it is quite different and it's quite empowering as mm-hmm. in when they, when they can, what I've observed, come together, feel understood, uh, relevant and engaged. Yeah. So yeah, maybe the execution hasn't been perfect, but I, I think we're a long way ahead of perhaps where we were f- even, you know, as recent as two to three years ago. 
completely agree. And I, I don't want to say that, you know, some of those that I don't want to say it all justifies the means. I will say that it's been proven over and over again that when people walk into a situation and they see others who in some way are like them, whether that can be physically, whether that can be how they communicate, whatever, they're more likely to stay in the community and they're more likely to contribute. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, when we were talking about inclusion and talking about my passion around women in technology, I went through a phase where I lost a lot of the women that I was interacting with and looking up to. And it made me question what I was doing. So we will get more women involved in the community and then we will have that flywheel happen. And I think it, it is all goodness and yeah, it, it will only benefit the community. And frankly, this dynamics community, which is so fierce and mighty and passionate, I can't think of a better community for this to happen in because it literally is like, you want to come in, come in. You want to talk about dynamics until 10 o'clock at night? Come on. Right. You want to do a hackathon? We'll do it. Love it. Absolutely. So it. true. So what about STEM and, and mm -hmm. what do you see as happening positively? Are you seeing things happen positively to, to see um, more diversity, more inclusion coming, uh, you know, through STEM at a university level, which is ultimately going to feed our future, if you yeah. like, as an, as the, as the, into the roles that we, we have now, what do you say? Are you seeing changes? Is it positive? What's, what's your views? So, and you know, I probably should have said at the beginning, I am by no means an expert at any of this. I don't have any degrees, right? This no, is no, just no, no. Carissa's observation being a woman in high tech for 25 years. And also, by the way, raising three daughters. And the STEM thing is interesting because my daughter, my oldest, wicked smart at math, very artistic as well. She won the lottery to go to the local STEM school, local STEM high school, as well as another uh, specialized high school program, which is more along the lines of the arts. And I'm sitting there at home and I'm like biting my tongue and I'm just like, I know who this child is. This child is me. I know her. And as much as that STEM spot is valued and I think she would just do great, I know the other program's better for her. When we went to the STEM night, I was super impressed. It was really intense. Lots of young women there. Awesome. Right? So I think that is helping. I will tell you, I went to a talk yesterday by the woman who started Girls Who Code, Reshma. And she was talking about how they've put 180,000 <laughs> females through this program, right? Yet she's starting to hear now from people who go through the program that they can't get the interviews. They're not getting in the door, right? So, so 180,000 so, have been through the program, uh -huh. but then they're not getting that next step. Yeah. So she's starting wow. to hear this and she's gathering this feedback. And so... To answer your question a really long way, I think STEM is great and it's building up. We still see, stats are showing you still see young women dropping out of STEM in ninth or 10th grade, right? And this is something that Rushman talks about in the sense that when young women come in and they do something, if it's not perfect, they're scared to show their work or they think they can't do it. Unlike in many cases, a male child has been raised differently. They're just like, oh, just keep going, keep going, keep going. And so that dropout rate is still happening. And then on the other side of it is that we've built this pipeline and we don't think it's being embraced quite yet. Then we run into the problem of the dashboarding, which is like, well, we have to bring women in for the interviews. Yes, that'd be great. You still need to choose people based on their capabilities. So we, and, but there's things you can do, right? To help with STEM, have mentors be female. When they go in to do interviews, if they do get the interview, have a woman be on the interview panel. There are things we can be doing because you can hit, tell you hit a topic for me, right? Because we're investing all this energy in STEM. I was right there. I was the parent taking my daughter to the STEM information night. But if you don't follow through with the actual inclusion, with the actual practices, it's money and time lost. So there's still work to do. So let's uh, talk about partners then. Are you seeing uh -huh. partners like, you know, we can have a candid conversation here around inclusion and it's something that, you know, if, if you listen to my past podcasts, I've had various people on to discuss, you know, unconscious bias in the workplace. Yes. What, I, what I've found is a lot of people don't even know what you're talking about. They've got no, like, yeah. like I'm talking about CEOs of companies that I've had this conversation with and literally glaze over. I have, have no idea. So 
Does Microsoft see it's part of, and I, I know that in their, you know, in your kind of code of conducts, et cetera, mm-hmm. you're very clear about these things. Yes. Are you seeing kind of changes in the partner community to one, get educated, you know, um, yeah. uh, uh, on this and then start to address it even in their work environments, just as Microsoft have been very proactive in its organization? So I'm having conversations with with different individuals within partners, not owners, about it. And there's definitely an interest in learning more and an interest in ha- hearing all the voices. I have to be completely honest, is like when I go to events where it's our top partners, you know, some kind of an executive gathering, it's men. It's mostly men. And you know something, and that is because those are like we discussed earlier, our partner channel has a lot of history and has some partners that have been in it for a long time, right? I'm really looking forward to the next five, seven years as more women start being in charge of these partners and having bigger roles. And then that's going to bring the up the, the swell with them. That's going to bring more and more people. I do think there is an inclination in any industry, not necessarily ours, where it's like, if I, diversity almost slows you down. Right. I mean, because you have to stop, you have to listen to more voices, you have to take more things into consideration and man, there's work to be done. Come on, let's go. And so, you know, if a partner is incredibly successful and at a certain point in in its life, you know, whatever you want to call it, they may not be as willing to do that. But I'm running into more now that are. And I think I definitely feel that Microsoft is leading by example. And I think having these conversations, you know, and kudos to you for pushing people on it and kudos to you for pushing me on it. These conversations need to happen. And we will, we will get there. We will. Things never happen as fast as we want. Exactly. Exactly. But no, I, I think it's, it's good that we're talking about it and hopefully it will raise conversations with people that listen to this that, that, that need to be had. Listen, we've, we've, uh, we've run out of time. So let, let's get <laughs> on to some quick talk. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, actually, before we go uh, switch topics to my quick fire questions, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I mean, I feel I feel like we could talk about this more and more yeah. and more. I just really hope that people are having the conversation and that I, I've always wanted people to feel like, uh, assume innocence here. When people approach mm-hmm. you about the conversation of, are we including you? What can I do to help? They genuinely mm. want to know, right? Yeah. Don't put up defenses about it and, and try not to feel awkward about it. If you yeah. come from a place of authenticity, it's all goodness. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Let's get on some quick fire questions. Okay. Tell me about some uh, daily rituals that kind of set you on the right path for a successful day. Oh, wow. I like to work out in the morning whenever I can. Mm-hmm. I definitely have a Starbucks ritual. I'm a Pacific Northwest girl. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter where I am. I have got to go find a Starbucks at some point and have my decaf, well, half decaf venti Americano with steam soy. <laughs> I am trying to get much more deliberate about taking breaks. I'm not good at that. And just taking 10 or 15 minutes, we have this beautiful new building here on campus, building 122. And it has like a library. It has a, it has like meditation rooms. It's got, and just go sit and be quiet, right? It has game rooms. That's hard, but that's, that's what I'm working on. Okay. I'm working on being that more deliberate. I will tell you every day I practice gratitude, every interaction something can take things in a positive, every interaction, there's something that comes out of it and you need to realize what you want out of it or that you have an impact on people. And I try to be really just grateful for, for what I have. Excellent. Excellent. What would you advise your younger self? Definitely take more risks and don't worry so much about what people think. That is actually one of the things that when I do coaching, that is something that comes up all the time because you get into a situation and you screw up and it's a minor screw up, right? But Oh, we beat ourselves up about it for hours, for days, we lose sleep. And it's like, guess what? No one else in the room is even thinking about that because everyone is so self-absorbed. They're not thinking about how Kathy said that one question that was really, what? That was a little bit off topic, right? Nobody's thinking about that. So speak up, right? It's don't be so concerned or don't be, it's that self-critical voice. And it starts with women very young. And I'm sorry, don't tell me men don't have it. They have it. Everybody has it. It's human nature. Yeah. Just don't listen to that self-critical voice. Don't. Yeah, it's good. It's good. 
What are you learning that's new, kind of uh, whether it be reading, watching, listening, that type of thing? But what what's your uh, w- yeah? What's new for you from a learning perspective? So I am revigorating my French language. Just I uh, I had a I have a degree in Fran- French, but I haven't had a chance to use it much, and so I am very focused right now on getting my fluency back in French. As far as reading, I am reading the Broken Earth trilogy right now from N.K. Jemison, which is fascinating. It's so well written. It's really disturbing, but it's so well written that it's inspiring me to write more, go back to my my fiction writing. So I would say those are the two things. Oh, and I'm supposed to be training for a half marathon and it's not going wow. well. <laughs> wow. That's full on. That's full on. Yes. Excellent. Who do you recommend as a guest for the podcast in future? Have you talked to Tom Yang yet? No. Okay. So he's our customer service. So he is the worldwide lead for customer service, like a Ben Vollmer is for field service. Tom is nothing but energy. I presented with him just recently at Ready, and he can't sit still. He has so much knowledge, but he can't sit still. So be prepared because he'll talk more than I do. Awesome. I love him. So try to get him, and then I can come up with some other suggestions too. Awesome. Carissa, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. If people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, LinkedIn is absolutely wonderful. I follow me, send me a note. I I love connecting with people. This has been just a gift. So thank you, Mark. It's been a lot of fun and I hope we get to do it again. Hey, thanks for coming on the Dynamics 365 show. I'm your host, business applications MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If you want to keep up to date with what I'm doing in 2019, subscribe at nz365guide.com. Full show notes can be found at nz365guide.com forward slash 77. See you next time.